Cold, piercing, icy, absolute. It was the only thing that I could feel in the sub-zero degree water. No way to see, no way to scream. Hypersleep in actuality had been nothing quite like I'd seen before in movies or television. My eyes taped shut and my ears plugged. There was nothing but the excruciating pain to remind me that I was even still alive. I was sure that I would die before stasis was triggered. But thankfully, and without warning, I felt the inky black of space take over completely. For once, I was happy to be asleep. I don't remember a single dream I have ever had, having been an insomniac for much of my life. But I remember the dream from hypersleep. I was lost at sea. The ocean was a deep, bottomless black. There was a sky, but its midnight purple hue was almost indistinguishable from the black sea and the darkness masked any shadows of the many creatures I could sense just in just below my feet. Once or twice I felt what seemed like rows of teeth running ever so softly down my legs. It could have been for just a moment, or maybe an eternity. But without warning or pain, something pulled me downward and straight into the abyss. I didn't dare open my eyes. All I could do was pray for a quick death. First sensation I regained was a wave of warmth that washed over my exposed, waterlogged body. I couldn't see yet, and I could feel my soaked and rubbery skin from such a long submersion. Quickly I noticed a flurry of voices. One was muffled and distant, another one was closer and clearer. It was Weaver, our medical technician, just awakening from hypersleep himself. As my eyes creaked open, his nearly perfect physique, at even 50 plus years of age, was alluring and helped bring my other senses into focus. Instantly my ears were filled with a sharp, shooting pain. A blaring alarm sounded off and would quickly force the remaining fogginess into a tree. I knew this alarm. I had heard it before. It was the life support failsafe system I had designed myself. A growing dread replaced the momentary excitement I had felt only seconds ago. I turned over quickly, splashing water everywhere to see who it was. It was Dr. Evan Bigham, my mentor and colleague. It happened only once before in recorded space flight, but he went into cardiac arrest the exact moment he'd entered stasis. His heart was now failing him without the machines to keep him alive. Weaver was the first to reach him and frantically began performing CPR, though it was all in vain as the all too familiar sound of a flat landing heart monitor were the only things we could hear outside of Weaver's desperate pleas. Roberts, the ship's captain, rushed to stop Weaver's endless compressions, knowing it was too late. Before Roberts ushered me out, I saw Weaver pull out a long strand of beads and kneel while he performed a small prayer. The next few hours were a haze as the rest of the crew awakened and processed the news of our fallen leader. The doctor's death had elevated me to a chief science officer, though there was no joy to be had in assuming this title. I had hoped one day to lead an expedition myself into the black, but this isn't how I thought it would go. The Dr. Bigham was my hero, and had been so since the first day I stepped into his classroom at university. He had such a fire in his soul for astronomy, and would reject all absolutes with physics. Nothing is impossible, was his mantra. He would talk endlessly about how faster than light travel could be possible, how humanity could harvest the power of dark energy and finally become the titans of the universe. His passion was infectious, and from that day forward I made it my own life's goal to see humanity finally gain access to the stars. Our long sleepless nights and endless research finally paid off with the creation of the space research vehicle, Arkham, powered by the mythical Alcubierre Drive. Dr. Bigham, the wizard of astrophysics, had created it through some miracle of science and technology. Though I'd refused to share with the world, even me, just how we'd done it. 
Now here I was, about to lead its maiden voyage without its creator to bask in its glory. Alone on the bridge, I got to work waking up the various sectors and preparing for our first hyperspace jump. That's when I noticed it. It was strange at first. I wasn't sure what to make of it. I tried to align the ship with Alpha Centauri, but the ship's computers kept failing to plot a course. I knew I was doing everything correctly. I had embedded my very soul into the ship. Troubled, I looked out into the expanse of interstellar space that lay before me. My eyes grew weary as I searched for a familiar constellation. Once I found one, I traced it back to the spot where I knew Alpha Centauri to be. Only there was no twinkling star to greet me. This was impossible. Surely some kind of post-traumatic stress from our long voyage, and now Dr. Begum's unfortunate passing. As far as our scans could detect, our destination had gone dark. An unease like anything I'd ever experienced before crept over me as I left the bridge and walked down the cold, long, dark corridors. Dr. Begum must have known. How many others knew? What else had the doctor been hiding? I puzzled over this newfound mystery as I silently entered the presentation room and joined the rest of the crew. Roberts was doing her best to maintain appearances, but rumors of a romance with the doctor had floated around for months before launch. Now her stark and blank expression, along with her spirit eyeliner, betrayed her true heart of hearts. Captain, I need to address the crew. I was shaky and unsure as I spoke. Roberts was a commanding figure within the crew, a no-nonsense stronghold of a woman who could drink me under the table before beating me over the head with it. All right, but after the briefing, her words stern and cut straight through the bone. I'm sorry, but this can't wait. There's something that I've just discovered, and that was an order, player. Now please start the presentation and have a seat. You may speak after the briefing. It was a swift rebuke of my desperate pleas, also a confirmation that she already knew what Dr. Bigham was about to posthumously tell us. Quietly, I obeyed her instructions and began starting up the presentation when I heard Weaver speak up. Excuse me, Captain Roberts. Please have a seat and wait until the briefing is over before speaking, Dr. Weaver, Roberts repeated. With all due respect, Captain, I think we should take a few minutes to honor Dr. Bigham. He is, after all, the only reason any of us are here, Weaver said bluntly. It surprised me when Roberts gave him the slightest of nods and approval. Nobody had ever dared speak out against a captain before. Weaver led the rest of the group in another prayer. I bowed my head and closed my eyes respectively. But having never been a religious person myself, his words rang hollow and tasted like paper. Still, it brought some level of closure to hear Weaver speak so kindly of the doctor and his work, to know that his peers had truly respected him. When Weaver was finished, I flashed him a smile, and he returned it in kind. Remembering the situation at hand, I hastily pressed play on Dr. Bigham's briefing. His haggard face flashed up on screen, the deep ridges in his skin prominent, and his hazel eyes looking straight into the camera from behind his absurdly oversized glasses. There was a deadly seriousness to his expression, though, a rarity for the doctor. Whatever the reason for Alpha Centauri's sudden disappearance, it had taken quite the effect. The knot of anxiety that had formed in my stomach was twisting into a monumental sense of grave danger. Fellow crew of the Arkham, be my greatest failure should these recordings ever reach you, for it means that my journey alongside your Alpha Centauri has failed, and now I must place upon you the most terrible of burdens. But now you have cleared the Orc Cloud and are in the last preparations to perform the very first hyperspace jump, using the immaculate design jump drive of my own creation. You know this to be your primary and only objective to oversee the first successful faster-than-light voyage to our closest stellar neighbor, the star system designated Alpha Centauri, then return home. This is only half true. The bomb. I looked over at Captain Roberts and met her gaze in return. 
Her attention could not be further away from Dr. Begum's presentation. Instead, she appeared to be studying me, looking for my reaction. My confused face must have surprised her as she turned away in the same second our eyes had met. What you are about to hear is considered top secret by every recognized sovereign body on Earth. Four years before the start of our voyage, an amateur astronomer reported a strange finding to NASA. Our closest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, had suddenly and without warning vanished from sight. A murmur of conversation had spread amongst the crew. An entire star system vanished. Impossible, surely a miscalculation. Hearing those words come from Dr. Bickham's mouth, I still didn't believe it. There is no precedent for this. A star cannot simply vanish, especially not the star that's closest to us. Dr. Beckham paused for a few moments, allowing us to absorb the full weight of his words. I noticed his hands trembling, a condition he had kept hidden from most. They hadn't stopped shaking the entire video. Repeated attempts to locate the binary star system have all failed. The third member of the system, Proxima Centauri, is still detectable, but we have been receiving strange oddities and fluctuations in output. Your primary destination is now the region of the planet located within the Red Dwarf's habitable zone. There you will make your initial observations. A crew of two will then board the ship's emergency shuttle, which has been outfitted with a modified jump drive that will allow for short-range jumps. You will then chart a route to the site of Alpha Centauri, Record any data there is to be recorded, then report back to the Arkham. If all succeeds, you will then chart a course back to your present location to begin the journey back to Titan. You must not underestimate the severity of your situation. There is no natural phenomenon or physical phenomenon that we have ever recorded that is remotely capable of producing this anomaly. More troubling, I've traced several star maps from all across history, and there is a direct line of stars that have disappeared all throughout the galaxy that leads directly to Alpha Centauri. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you which system is closest to Proxima Centauri. Also, there is the nature of the jump drives themselves. They are powered by an extremely volatile engine, and miscalculations and impact debris are high risk factors. You must proceed with the utmost caution. You are all truly in no man's land now. The doctor took a long pause and ran his hands through his thinning, curly gray hair before taking one last look at the camera. One can only hope that these files never reach you and that we will solve this mystery together. But if not, these truly are my last words to you. Godspeed. With that, the screen went blank and a heavy, uncomfortable silence cloaked the entire room. Roberts was the first to break the silence. Blair, you had something to say? She asked with just a hint of sarcasm. No, not anymore, I said blankly, still locked into a gaze with the blank screen. My mind was racing over the possibilities, over what could have happened to Alpha Centauri and the other stars Dr. Bickham had mentioned. Proxima Centauri, a low-mass red dwarf, appeared to be next. Though it wasn't visible to the naked eye, so we'd have no idea of knowing what was there until we got there. Roberts took notice of the shocked expressions of the entire crew, for the first time spoke with just the slightest hint of concern in her voice. Dr. Bigham left detailed instructions for all of us in the event of his death. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? Yeah, I have one. Are you insane? There is no way that we could go through with this mission now that we just lost our lead scientist. Torrance, the ship's pilot, and Robert's second in command was the first to protest. His fear and anger were clear as he practically spat through his teeth. Torrance and I had once been peers of Dr. Bigham before I had been chosen to be his assistant. And our already fragile and competitive relationship quickly soured after that. I agree. We have no clue what to expect now. I think we should test the drive to get back to Seoul. That's a far better course of action considering what's happened. I was surprised to hear Weaver joining in with Torrance. Weaver had a reputation for being rash and making risky choices that ended up saving countless lives. But now he too was cloaked in the same fear as Torrance was, as we all were. 
We cannot risk damaging the ship by flying through the Oort Cloud. That's precisely why we had to wait until we had cleared it to make our first jump. As I've said, there are specific instructions. Torrance cut Roberts off, which is something that no one had ever dared to do. I don't care. These are far beyond normal circumstances. Not only is the man who built the ship that got us here dead, this entire mission was all a lie. Torrance was out of breath as he finished. He was scared, I could tell. Whatever concern and humanity Roberts had displayed earlier was quickly replaced by her usual cold, icy demeanor. Officer Torrance, you signed an Iron Klein contract. Now, of course, I cannot force you to take part. Our superiors are trillions of miles away. If you refuse, however, you will be forcibly placed back into hypersleep until the completion of the mission and our return to Titan. There you will be placed under arrest and stripped of your title, status, and all privileges. I have to admit, there was something provocative and sensual about the way Roberts took control of any situation. It's almost amusing to see Torrance shrink in the presence of such a commanding woman. No doubt both of them wanted to curb stomp the other. Still, Torrance had never been able to read a room, and so he continued on with his tirade. I'd like to see you try, seriously. I'll fight every single one of you. Nobody's forcing me to do anything. Torrance was really trying to put on a brave front, but it just shattered completely in the face of someone so much bigger, more powerful, and more intimidating than him. If somebody didn't interject soon, this wasn't going to end well. As Roberts made a motion towards Torrance, sneaking on my feet, I jumped up to place myself between the two. Stop it, both of you. This isn't helping us. My voice broke, and I didn't feel near the confidence I was trying to project. Roberts, taken aback, could only stare at me with her mouth slightly agape. Torrance, however, looked poised to attack at any moment. My feet stood firm, though, and I continued. Torrance, I know you're scared. I I'm scared, too. But you heard what Dr. Bickham said. This isn't about us. This is about everyone back at home. Screw you, player. What else did you know? You had your hand so far up Dr. Bickham's ass, he must have told you everything. Torrance spat out, his tone growing more aggressive by the second. I knew it was only a matter of time before Roberts forced her way back between us. I didn't know, I swear. I only found out just now, just like you. I wouldn't have agreed to come had I known the truth. I lied, hoping Torrance would take the bait. We all signed the same contract, Torrance. There's 10 billion back on Earth that are waiting for us, counting on us. Not to mention everything that'll be within our grasp. The whole Milky Way, Andromeda, the local group, maybe even the entire observable universe. I know you, Torrance, and I know there's no way you wouldn't want to be a part of that. We need you. Torrance's shoulders relaxed, and I could sense his breathing return to normal, though Roberts looked on suspiciously. Well, now that we've all regained composure, we'll start the first jump to Proxima Centauri in T-minus one hour. You have your instructions. Dismissed. Roberts didn't stay any longer and disappeared into her personal quarters. Not able to stand the thought of more drama, I left without a word and headed back to the bridge. As I brought all the systems online, the only thing I could think about was Alpha Centauri. Nothing but titanic darkness lay in the spot where our closest stellar neighbor once was. What could have possibly caused an entire star system to disappear? The only actual option in my head was some sort of rogue black hole encounter. Something that had remained undetected, disrupting the system, sending Alpha Centauri A and B into interstellar space. But even that remote possibility stretched my suspension of disbelief beyond its limits. The bridge doors opened, but I didn't register it at first, so the hand on my shoulder was quite a jolt. I jumped back to see Sydney, our most senior astronaut on the team. She'd always stood out with her ruby red hair that curled down and framing her petite body. She hadn't said a word during the presentation and the resulting aftermath but I could tell from her pale expression that she harbored fear of her own. Oh shit, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. And she sputtered sincerely. Sydney was the exact opposite of Roberts in almost every conceivable way, and in many respects reminded me a great deal of Dr. Bigham. She had joined the NASA space program right out of college and was the first woman to set foot on Titan at just 24 years old. 
The subsequent decades spent in space had taken quite the toll on her physical appearance, but her natural curiosity about the unknown had still kept her from settling down. It's okay, I assured her, turning my head back towards the expanse of space. I could sense the view equally entranced Sydney. Despite our now unprecedented predicament, it was still a marvel of a technical achievement to see what we were seeing. The countless specks of glimmering light shining from hundreds and thousands of miles away, a living time capsule of an era long gone. It was truly a dream come true. I just wish Dr. Bickham were there to see it with me. As if she could read my mind, Sydney spoke up. Hey, um, I wanted to say that, well, I'm sorry about Dr. Bickham. I know the two of you were close. Her timing was incredible. I lost my breath for a second and almost shed a tear. Though it was comforting to hear her parting words, only a select few could really say they knew who Dr. Evan Bickham truly was as a person, as a scientist, as a human being. So, any chance that there are aliens waiting for us in Alpha Centauri? She half-heartedly laughed out. Don't you know that the answer is always aliens? <laughs> I chuckled in response. We both tried to play it off cool, but the tension was still thick in the room. We made small talk, reminiscing over our various memories of working with the doctor until the rest of the crew joined us one by one. Roberts was the last still trying to hide her pain behind a wall of emotional indifference, and obviously retouched her makeup. But the scars are still visible, and I felt her pain. Admired her courage in the face of such heartbreak. Torrance, however, had made his contempt well known, rudely brushing past me as he made his way to his co-pilot chair. Roberts made her way to the front of the bridge before stopping to gaze into the abyss. I wondered what monsters, if any, gazed back into her. Blair, are we ready to begin? She asked blankly as she strapped herself in. All systems are online and ready, I replied. Torrance, do we have the ship aligned with Proxima Centauri? Torrance let out a reluctant yes with as much venom as he could muster. Good. Begin the charging sequence, Blair. My fingers hovered over the buttons needed to trigger the sequence. This was the moment we'd all been waiting for. We were about to engage in the first faster-than-light voyage to another star system. This was bigger than the moon landing, bigger than Titan, bigger than anything humanity had ever attempted before. It was a terrifying prospect, and in that moment I wasn't sure if I wanted to know what awaited us in Proxima Centauri anymore. Blair, is there a problem? Roberts asked curtly. No, Captain. Then please begin the charging sequence. Without a word, my fingers began doing their thing. My anxiety was through the roof, and I had trouble staying focused, entering the wrong sequence of codes more than once. It took close to two minutes before I heard the telltale signs of the injuring powering on above me. As the ship truly came to life, the entire bridge began to vibrate, slowly at first, but increasing in intensity as the drive charged up. I looked around, studying the crew. Torrance's expression had changed from just barely contained anger to outright hostility. Sydney was still staring ahead into space along with Roberts. Besides her was the empty seat where Dr. Bigham should have been. I only glimpsed Reaver before he turned away, but his expression was one of hesitation and fear. His eyes closed and he began whispering to himself again. His faith had long been a curiosity to me, in an era where very few still practiced. It was the cornerstone of his career, he had said, though, and it appeared to give him the strength needed in times of crisis. So who was I to judge? Jump drive, fully charged. Ready for launch, the ship's automatic computer system announced. On my command, Roberts boomed. I took the longest, deepest breath I had ever taken in my life, then braced my mind, body, and soul for whatever was to come. Roberts couldn't have known it, but her next words sealed her fate, as well as ours. Initiate. There was no pause, no hesitation, just the flip of a single switch. All at once, the sounds coming from somewhere deep within the ship increased by almost a hundredfold. 
My teeth threatened to shatter from the intense vibrations that now echoed through every part of my body. I could hear the surging discomfort from the crew. Sydney had begun hyperventilating and needed oxygen fast, but before I could disengage her emergency mask, the jump drive initiated. What followed next was an experience that bordered somewhere between pure ecstasy and an ungodly nightmare. From the back of the ship, an enormous force began pulling us backwards. For a split second, I'm sure I was about to phase right through my chair. Space itself distorted in front of us as our view of the universe contracted and then expanded. The pressure was gargantuan, my skin flattened against my body the way it does when you run your hands underneath an air dryer. Couldn't even turn my head an inch to see the rest of the crew and the roar of the ship had masked any cries they made. Trillions of miles flew past in an instant, closing the gap between us and Proxima Centauri. This was it, our monumental achievement in engineering. Against all odds, it had worked. At first, the space in front of us remained dark and empty. After what felt like only seconds, a pale red dot appeared on the horizon. Proxima Centauri loomed ahead, growing brighter and brighter with each passing second. The ship's computer reminded me to begin deacceleration. With great difficulty, I moved my fingers over the switch and immediately felt the ship begin to slow down. But just moments later, the entire ship jolted and sparks flew overhead. Something had impacted the ship. This was not good. A second later, another impact caused another shower of sparks to shower down all around us. Screams from some of the crew, mostly Sydney, reverberated all around me. From over top the screams, I could hear Roberts attempting to give out orders to remain calm, which of course fell upon death ears. Warning. Damage critical. Disengage jump drive. That wasn't a good sign. Him and our shield generator was failing. Blair, disengage! Roberts ordered from underneath another torrent of sparks. We can't stop at these speeds. The G-forces will destroy the ship. I knew what would happen if I listened to her. We could do nothing but wait and pray that we cleared the debris field. The ship finally stopped jolting, and once we reached the minimum of safe speed, I disengaged the jump drive. The ship lurched violently forward, nearly ripping us out of our seats. Its structural integrity had held up, but only just... Multiple systems were offline, including all of our communication channels. I unbuckled myself quickly to survey the damage, blocking out the cries and attempts at Roberts to maintain control. There were much more important things to deal with right now. As far as I could see, the cargo hold housing all of our ground surveying equipment and rovers was compromised, so there was no telling just how much equipment we'd lost. The shuttle was thankfully still operational from what I could tell, as was the jump drive itself. It was when I heard Weaver pushing himself between Roberts and Torrance that I knew I had to intervene. I shouted for everyone to shut up and listen, and as best I could, I told them what we needed to do right now if we wanted to stand a chance of getting back home. The energy in the room changed instantly. Despite the near-death experience and growing feuds, the crew immediately sprang into action. Roberts took advantage of this to assert control but I could tell from several faces that this wasn't going to last long. Sydney and I went to assess the cargo hold, hoping that the breach was small. We were dismayed to find that the breach had completely wrecked the compartment. Several small holes had created enough suction to pull most of the equipment to the walls. Sparks were flying everywhere, and from the looks of it, all of our planetary surveillance rovers were in pieces all over the ceiling. We'd have to patch the holes from the outside before we could enter. Weaver joined us as Roberts watched from the bridge. She continued to bark orders at everyone, but was losing her cool as most of them went unheard or ignored. And there was nothing she hated more than losing her authority. Taking this opportunity I had with Weaver, I thanked him for his kind words and acknowledgement of Dr. Bickham's life. Weaver said it was an honor to be on his crew and that the doctor would be proud of me to have taken his place. That one did make me tear up. As we worked, my eyes kept drifting back to Proxima Centauri, enraptured by its glowing red light and dominance of the pitch black sky. 
We patched all the holes and repressurized the compartment, not that it did us much good. The data collection modules and surveying equipment were trashed, which left us with no way to scan the planets of the Proxima Centauri system. When we got back to the bridge, Roberts informed us that she would be overriding Dr. Bigham's instructions and would accompany Torrance to Alpha Centauri herself. Dr. Bigham had chosen me to go collect the data, and I was about to protest when Torrance, in a fit of anger, swung at Reaver as he tried to come between him and Roberts. I dove in to block him, and ended up getting the full brunt of his fist to my left temple. The last thing I remember is my body hitting the floor before the pitch black took over again. No dreams this time, thankfully. When I woke, Weaver was standing over me, looking as striking as ever. He smiled, and a smile that I returned in kind. It took a great effort to resist the powerful urge to kiss him. Weaver said that Torrance was in isolation, with Roberts just one click away from placing him back into stasis. As I got up, a wave of searing pain in my temples nearly put me back on the table. Being the angel that he was, Weaver gave me some beautiful pink pill that instantly put my throbbing headache at ease. Roberts wants all of us back on the bridge as soon as you're ready, Weaver replied. I silently agreed and left with him at once. When we arrived back on the bridge, they had led Torrance out of isolation, but he was still brooding in the corner by himself. I could feel the hate radiating off of him while Roberts looked almost disheveled and not at all her usual self. I walked over to her with a lump in my stomach. Captain, I have to ask, are you sure about having me stay behind? Dr. Vickham stated, Roberts cut me off before I could finish my protest. I know what he said, I was there. I know how to collect and analyze data, Blair. What I don't know are the ins and outs of this ship, and if something happens to you before the ship is operational again, we might never get back to Earth. It's not just you either, it's Torrance. His behavior is unpredictable, and if he impedes the mission, I'm not sure you'll be able to do what is necessary to prevent him from interfering further. Roberts had always been cold and direct, but never before had I heard her insinuate such violence, especially towards a fellow crew member. I silently nodded in agreement, though, knowing that there was nothing I could do to change her mind. There was still plenty of work that needed to be done on the ship, that much was true. And Sydney and I would have ample opportunity to collect what data we could from the Proxima Centauri system. Still part of me yearned to see what had become of Alpha Centauri, if there was anything left to see. Roberts asked for a status update on repairs, which were still ongoing. The shuttle, however, was up and ready for launch. With that, the three of us began making our way to the loading dock. How long will it take us to reach Alpha Centauri? Roberts asked. We had designed the drive aboard the shuttle only for short-range jumps, and it was still untested, so it was impossible to say for certain. And the jump itself should be fairly short, though recharging should take a while, 12 hours at least. Good. Dr. Blair, until I return, the Arkham is under your command. Stay sharp, you hear me? Roberts sounded almost friendly as she and Torrance suited up. Bade them one final goodbye, to which Roberts responded with a nod. Torrance surprised me, however, when he spoke up. Good luck, soldier. There was something so stark and so brutal about the way he said those famous last words. Only thing I could do was smile back. The airlock doors slid into place, and cutting off contact with my fellow crew for the last time. It's beyond breathtaking, observing faster than light travel from a distance. One second, the shuttle was just drifting off into the distance. Then all at once, the surrounding space warped around like the usual gravity lensing we see from black holes. But only for a moment. Space returned to normal as quickly as it distorted, and a brilliant flash of concentrated light blasted across the expanse of black space. I stood and watched the tiny streak of light fade quickly, and was soon left with only my thoughts for the first time since our arrival. As de facto captain, I now had access to all areas of the Arkham. A newfound desire was growing in me. The desire to see what made this ship tick. As if almost on impulse, I began making my way through the labyrinthine network of passageways to the engine compartment. Dr. Bigham wanted it to be as difficult as possible for anyone other than him to access this area of the ship, and for all intents and purposes, he succeeded. It took me almost half an hour, but I finally made it to the dark, narrow corridor that led to the engine room. The familiar hissing of the hydraulics sounded, and the door opened. 
Inside was about the most mundane room you could ever hope to find on a spaceship. The room was marble white, save for an intricate black metal tube that encircled the entire room. I recognized it immediately as a particle accelerator. At the center of the room, a series of cylindrical tubes mechanically rose from the floor. I was in awe, completely speechless. The tubes rose all the way into the ceiling and appeared to be containers of some sort. From behind a glass panel, they appeared empty. I studied them for a bit longer, then saw something almost indescribable. The space inside the container seemed to distort at random, folding in and out of itself. Several possibilities immediately came to mind. Surely this was some form of exotic matter, but what and how could it be antimatter? Had Dr. Bickham finally uncovered the secret to dark energy? What role did the particle accelerator play in this? For the first time in my life, I cursed Dr. Bickham's name. He had paid the ultimate price for his ego and left us all blind and wandering alone in the dark. I hated him in that moment. But I didn't have time to ponder these questions any further as the ship's intercom blared overhead. Blair, I need you in the observation room. It was Sydney's voice, sounding garbled and worried over the speaker. With haste, I navigated my way back to the central hub much quicker and faster than before. When I arrived, Sydney was hovering over her computer screens and looking much worse for wear. What's the problem? I asked, praying it was anything but bad news. I'm not sure. It's hard to explain. Sydney was flustered and on the verge of a breakdown. Only two of us. Well, since the landing modules were wasted, I thought we could use the ship's long-range telescopes to locate some of the planets. But they're nowhere to be found, just like Alpha Centauri. In the debris field that we ran into during our first jump, it's right within the same region as some of these planets. That might explain some of the random fluctuations we've been getting. What fluctuations? I asked, not liking where this was going. After we first arrived, I started plotting out a star map, and mostly there was no variation. But when I played back some of the first recordings, I noticed stars seemed to disappear and reappear almost at identical intervals. I think something is moving in front of it, but if that's true, it would have to be beyond gigantic. Sydney stumbled and sounded as if she herself didn't believe what she was saying. I was about to interject when the overhead and her comm sounded off again, this time from the ship's automated computer. Warning. Collision with shuttle imminent. T minus 10 minutes until impact. Impossible. There was no way the shuttle had returned already. Panicked, Sydney and I rushed to the observation deck and searched from inside the nearly two foot thick filtered glass for the shuttle. If they were adrift without the ability to maneuver, then we'd have to go spacewalk to retrieve it from hitting the ship. What happened to Roberts and Torrance? Why were they back already? Why couldn't they control the ship? These questions and more chilled my blood as we scanned the black horizon for any sign of the shuttle. There it is, Sydney exclaimed as she pointed upward to our left. Sure enough, just barely visible and about a quarter of a mile out was the shuttle, drifting slowly towards us. Could see the emergency lights were flashing, but other than that it looked completely abandoned. What do you think happened? I don't know. I'm going spacewalk. Sydney, you make sure the docking area is prepped. I radioed Weaver to meet me at the loading dock and raced to the airlock. Weaver was already there waiting, and together we suited up and entered the cold vacuum of space yet again. As soon as we were tethered to the ship, we propelled ourselves forward towards the approaching shuttle. As we got closer, I saw that the airlock doors were open, leaving the cockpit completely compromised. Weaver entered before me and began locking the doors so we could re-establish the atmosphere. I looked around, searching for any sign of our comrades, but everything that wasn't already locked down to the floor was now lost in the void of space. Weaver began piloting the shuttle back to the docks while I searched every corner and shelf for any signs of what happened. I did everything I could to maintain hope, but it drained away fast as my search came up empty. Dejected, I went to retrieve the flight recorder when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see one of the closet doors holding the additional spacesuits ajar. Funny, I could have sworn I just closed it. Cautiously, I approached and closed the door again. From behind the glass, the black metal suit with its golden sun visor looked more menacing than ever. 
was about to turn away when I froze. I swore I saw it move ever so slightly. I chalked it up to the stress and paranoia and went back to the flight recorder. When I turned around, the door was just slightly ajar as it had been before. I stared into the golden visor, sensing that there was something staring right back. The ship jolted and the airlock doors opened, through which I quickly fled, not wanting to spend another second looking at that suit. Weaver called out behind me, but I ignored him. I radioed for Sydney to make sure the shuttle was fully operational, to which she obliged with the promise that we would meet up with her again soon. Those were the last words I ever said to her. I can't remember if I ever thanked her for her hard work or told her how much I respected her. She was one of the best of the best. I'm so sorry, Sydney. It was an honor to have worked alongside you. Weaver finally caught up to me and together we headed back to the observation platform. While waiting for the flight recorder data to process, we pulled up the video archives from the shuttle. I hesitated before pressing play. Something deep in my gut told me that the scene about to unfold before us was anything but pleasant. We watched as Roberts and Torrance took off in the shuttle, successfully completing the jump to Alpha Centauri, then began its approach to the binary star system. That was when things shifted. The shuttle reported an odd disturbance, then the video files became increasingly corrupted. Soon Roberts and Torrance faded in and out of a sea of multicolor static. The audio, though corrupted, remained audible. I heard Torrance over the recorder shouting unintelligibly while Roberts tried to get him under control. The cabin rocked back and forth as if it was being pushed from the outside. What's happening? All systems stopped. All systems down. What's... Torrance, what are you... Torrance was rushing about in the cabin, tearing at the paneling, trying to claw his way out of the ship from the looks of it. He exited the frame and didn't reappear again. Torrance, what the hell? Torrance, what are you doing? The audio cut off for a moment only to resume with the sounds of horrified yelling in the ship's automated computers. Warning airlock deactivated. Cabin depressurizing I am 10 seconds. Stop, Torrance! What are you doing? Stop! No! The last split-second image we saw before the video cut out for good was of a frantic Roberts grabbing hold of her seat for dear life before the airlock doors opened. I turned before I could witness the vacuum of space suck Roberts out of frame and into the freezing void. Thankfully, her screams of agony were sharply cut off. The video file stopped after that, and we were left in a deafening silence. All I could hear were our shallow breaths as we absorbed the horror show that had just unfolded before us. Torrance had gone insane. Whatever they saw in Alpha Centauri had finally sent him over the edge, and he had taken Captain Roberts with him. A message flashed on the computer screen, telling us that the data had been fully processed and was ready. Hesitantly, I moved the cursor and one by one, numerous charts appeared on screen. From what I could gather, as the ship approached the site of Alpha Centauri, the long-range telescopes began picking up two small bodies of mass with temperature readings that were far cooler than any stellar body detected. The objects were roughly planet-sized, however, with a mass far greater than anything a planet could sustain. I pondered, struggling to come up with an hypothesis. Once one emerged, I sat back in my chair, shaking my head in disbelief. Something that had never been discovered before. Something that shouldn't even exist yet. What? What is it? Weaver was scared, but his fear was nothing compared to mine. Alpha Centauri, it, it's become a, a black dwarf. An icy chill ran all the way down my body and back up my spine as I said those last words. What's a black dwarf? I didn't expect him to know what it meant. How could he? It was an entirely unexplored area of the celestial sciences. It shouldn't exist. It couldn't exist. It was a complete impossibility. Black dwarfs are the stellar remnants of white dwarfs after they've cooled down to the temperature of the CMB. It's the last stage of all stars that don't turn into black holes. But these things shouldn't exist yet. The time that it takes a white dwarf to cool far exceeds the known age of the universe. We're talking quadrillions of years here. 
It should have been the most important discovery of my career. The wonder, though, was lost amongst the fear that had wrapped its icy fingers around us the moment we awoke from hypersleep. It felt like some fever dream. A hellish night terror that I kept praying would end. That I would awake with Dr. Begum alive on our way to make the ultimate mark in history. This was no dream come true. This was a living nightmare. What do we do? Weaver asked, the desperation now thick in his voice. I don't know if there's anything we can do. Whatever caused this change has made its way to Proxima. I trailed off. Mysterious fluctuations in light. The shifting constellations Sydney reported. Somewhere deep in the bowels of creation, something primordial was stirring. This wasn't a star system anymore. This was a stellar banquet, and Proxima Centauri was the final course. I was so deep in thought that I jumped back in my seat when the ominous voice of the ship's computer sounded off once more. Attention, all personnel report to the shuttle bay. A crew member has experienced catastrophic injury. Sydney. No. Something catastrophic had happened to her. I jolted upwards and ran down the long corridors to the shuttle bay with Weaver trailing right behind me. When the doors opened automatically, I was immediately assaulted with a scene of ungodly carnage. I registered only the image of blood soaking every surface of the airlock before the churning in my stomach overpowered me. I twisted downwards and voided the contents of my stomach, though I was sure I caught a glimpse of what looked like a severed arm hanging off a rafter. Weaver didn't handle it any better than I did, and we both fell backwards into the corridor. The stench of iron was thick, and it clung to the air. What the fuck? I'd never heard Weaver curse before. He dropped to his knees, sobbing as he pulled out his beads. His head hung low, and he did his best to mumble out a prayer, but his voice broke so much I could barely understand him. He'd remained so composed, more so than all of us. Yet it was his breakdown that truly broke me. How had this happened? Was there someone else aboard the ship? Could Dr. Bigham still be alive? Did he do this? Thinking quickly, I ordered a lockdown of the ship, but it denied my request. When I asked why, the answer was confusing at first. Second in command, Officer Torrance is now captain. Only captains may order a lockdown. No, Arkham. Officer Torrance is dead. I am still in command of the ship. Negative. Officer Torrance is back on board the ship. He has assumed command. Torrance wasn't on the ship, though. He had been on the shuttle when the cabin depressurized and was presumably lost in the void of space billions of miles away from here. But then I remembered the spacesuit on board the shuttle, how I'd seen it move, and how Torrance had disappeared right before the airlock breached. The suit. It had been the only thing left inside the shuttle. Torrance. He did this. His insanity had claimed two of our crew, and now it was loose aboard the ship. I looked down to see a trail of bloody footprints wander off down one of the corridors. Arkham, what is Officer Torrance's location? Officer Torrance is in the hypersleep compartment. What was he doing there? Weaver and I bolted back down the hall, but as we got closer, the sounds of shredding metal and electricity grew louder. Inside, we saw the towering figure of the Studatorans hacking away at one of the hypersleep tanks. From the looks of it, he had already destroyed four of them and was working on a fifth one when he turned to see us in the doorframe. My shoes were immediately soaked and I looked down to see the floor submerged in almost an inch of water. As I looked back up, two animalistic urges swelled up deep inside. I wanted nothing more than to tackle him to the floor and pummel him into dust for what he'd done to our crew. But my eyes moved to his left hand, which was holding the utility axe from the spacesuit, and I knew immediately that he had the advantage. His visor was still down, so nothing but our golden reflections bounced off his helmet, though I could still sense the rage and the fear that had only festered since his ill-fated trip to Alpha Centauri. Torrance, please, put down the axe! Weaver begged. His hands were outstretched and his palms open, but Torrance did not back down. Instead, he faced us, axe firmly gripped in both of his hands now. I saw it. I saw what it did, what it'll do to us. 
The more it eats, the more it grows, the more it grows, the more it eats. Torrance rambled from behind his helmet. His voice was muffled and distant, but the madness was as clear as day. He was too far gone. I knew it was no use. Torrance tensed up and then stared directly at me. Death and decay. That's what awaits us. That's what you've been looking for. You. You brought us here. You brought us here to die! Torrance lunged forward with the axe held high. I stepped back just in time to miss the blade of the axe fly right in front of my face and embed itself into the wall behind me. Weaver tried to grab a hold of him, only to be met with an elbow to the face, which knocked him back against the wall. Torrance grabbed the axe out of the wall and then lunged towards me again. I tried to run down the hall, but Torrance body slammed me to the floor, almost crushing me under the weight of his suit. I took a page from his book and elbowed him with as much force as I could, knocking the axe out of his grasp. Not that it did any good. As I tried to turn over, Torrance grabbed me by both of the arms and pinned me to the floor. Before I could do anything else, I felt the hard, metal helmet smash against my face. An intense pain sprung up, and soon my face was wet and thick with my blood. Torrance raised his head only to bring it down for a second time, and then a third. The fourth time, the visor finally shattered, sending shards glass raining down on me. I could feel my brain failing and the world around me became blurry. I didn't want to die like this. Silently, I prayed to myself for the first time in decades. And the only thing I had left now was the hope that it would be quick and painless. I looked up to see Torrance's bloody face stretched into a manic expression of rage, embraced for his next headbutt. Immediately, I felt Torrance convulse and lift his hands off of mine. Still out of focus with reality, I did my best to scamper away from the commotion. From what I could tell, Weaver was now standing above Torrance, who was withering on the floor and moaning in agony. I tried to get up, but fell straight back down to the floor by the fire now burning inside my head. I felt Weaver come to my side and help me to my feet. Torrance lay motionless on the floor now, a scalpel buried deep in the back of his suit. Weaver led me back to what remained of the hypersleep bay and assessed my injuries. I'd suffered a concussion, but that was the least of our worries. Arkham informed us that five of the six hypersleep tanks were now inoperable. I kept my eyes on Torrance as Weaver delicately bandaged me up, and for a moment, the tension that had blanketed the ship since our arrival had vanished. The ship's computer, which had comically been the bearer of bad news, had one more bad omen to share with us, one that immediately caught our attention. Warning, abnormal gravitational anomaly detected. I jumped up and started running towards the door, but was almost immediately sent back down to the floor. Weaver helped me steady, and together we slowly made our way back to the observation deck. Standing as close as we could to the window, we looked out into the dark for the anomaly. It didn't take long. From afar, space and light from the stars warped in odd, undefinable ways. It seemed like the very fabric of time and space was folding and unfolding, twisting the constellations into something unrecognizable. The Arkham, positioned roughly two light minutes away, but close enough for us to witness Proxima Centauri's last moments. There are events that defy explanation. Cosmic history is littered with unsolvable riddles and mysteries no man could ever hope to explain. No written word could ever sum up the fear, the dread of witnessing that behemoth devour the Red Dwarf Star. A deep fear had taken root inside of me, a fear of the universe itself. It twisted my love for the stars and the beauty of the cosmos into a dark, primeval awe and wonder. What other unseen horrors lay within the furthest depths of creation? What other beasts lay dormant, waiting to be discovered, waiting to devour? As the mass got closer, I could see small strands of superheated plasma break away from the Red Dwarf. Slowly, this monster of the universe cannibalized the last member of the Centauri system, completing its transformation to a cosmic graveyard. The entire scene would have been spectacular had it not been so nightmarish. Weaver was standing next to me and 
All I wanted in that moment was another human to hold, to connect to. Almost on instinct, I reached for his hand and wrapped my fingers around his. He didn't resist. In fact, he gripped my hand in his own. God Almighty, he whispered to himself. I can only imagine what horror was going on inside of his head, seemingly coming face to face with the devil himself. He prayed for both of us, reaching out for his God to save us. There's no God out here. There's only death and decay, just as Torrance had warned us. We have to do something, I said aloud, though I knew it was futile. As insignificant as we were, what could we do to fight against this leviathan? There was no force of nature we could harness that could stand a chance at annihilating this thing. I wished it had been me instead of Dr. Bickham. It was his genius that got us here, and now we needed him more than ever. Then I remembered. The engine room. I'd completely forgotten. It was a lifetime away, though it couldn't have been more than an hour ago. I know what we have to do, I said plainly, my mind now racing to formulate a plan. I explained to Weaver the engine room, the mysterious matter that powered the ship. The way time and space was affected by this creature, it must be made of the same matter. Dr. Bickham knew. He'd known all along. We have to fly the ship into Proxima Centauri and breach the engine room. I told Reaver as I finished. Are you sure that'll even work? Reaver asked, frantic and sweating profusely. No, but it's the only chance that we've got at destroying this thing and saving everyone back home. Reaver, get all the supplies that you can and get to the shuttle. You can hold both of us and get us back to Seoul. I can go to the bridge and set the ship on autopilot. Together we can blow this fucker into space. Reaver nodded in agreement. We gave each other one final weak smile and set off in separate directions in a little race against time. When I got to the bridge, the Arkham informed me that Torrance was still in command and therefore could not activate the autopilot without his consent. He was still alive after all. And if Torrance was still technically alive, then there was only one thing I could do to reclaim command. I wasn't sure if I had it in me. It wasn't his fault we'd all been lied to and led like lambs to the slaughter. Dr. Bigham deceived us all, and Torrance, he was... He was just another victim of all of his lies. But this was bigger than us, though. Unfortunately, Torrance was only an obstacle right now, and one that needed to be eliminated. It had to be done. I had made my way back to the hypersleep bay, internally justifying in every way I could what I was about to do. But before I made it there, the Arkham sounded off one last ominous message. Attention, a crew member has experienced catastrophic injury in the hypersleep bay. No, not again. I cried out for Weaver and broke into a feverish run. My head was still throbbing, but I pushed through it. I fear it would be too late. I shouldn't have let him go off alone. Weaver was dead now, it would be all because of me. I feared the worst as I entered the hypersleep bay and saw blood spatter mixed all over the wall. But then I saw the crumpled mass of Torrance laying face up in the mixture of blood and water. The axe he had held just moments earlier was now buried deep in the back of his head, his eyes and mouth bulging wide open. He was dead, that much was for sure. The corner of my eye caught some movement and spun around to see Weaver on the floor, clutching his chest. Blood had pooled all around his waist, but he was still alive and breathing. I rushed to his side and held him up. He got me. He was waiting for me. But I got him. He mumbled out. The color was straining away from him by the second. Not really knowing what I was doing, I searched the room for any supplies, grabbing what bandages and alcohol I saw. I did the best job I could, but the gash in his chest was deep. The mess of blood and bandages made it hard to see the wound, and Weaver groaned in pain as I attempted to stitch him up. After about a minute, he grabbed my arm and knocked the bandage away. Just go, Blair. Take the shuttle and get out of here. Of course, he would try to play hero. No, not this time. I wasn't going to let that happen. 
I ignored him and tried to reapply the bandage, but he just smacked it away again. I made it. Get out of here. Just leave. Pilot the ship into the star and save us. Save everyone back home. He pleaded. I don't know what came over me in that moment, but I smacked him right in the face. No, I'm not leaving behind, soldier. We're both making it out of here, you hear me? Now shut up and let me apply this. I barked at him and reapplied the bandage, fashioning a tourniquet as tight as I could. We were grimaced in pain, but the bleeding finally appeared to stop. I grabbed the bag of supplies Weaver had gathered and helped him to his feet. The trek back to the shuttle was long, and Weaver continued to insist that I leave him behind, but I blocked him out and just pressed onward. Arkham engaged the autopilot and set the launch for five minutes. I ordered for the last time as we entered the shuttle. Copy that. Launch in T-minus five minutes. Safe travels, Dr. Blair. Weaver was fading in and out so I had to strap him into the seat myself. I just prayed that he would survive the jump if he fell unconscious, and strapped myself into the pilot's seat right next to him. Launch sequence started automatically, and I watched as the long cylindrical form of the Arkham faded quickly into view, marveling one last time at Dr. Bickham's creation. I could only hope and pray I'd live long enough to unlock the mystery of the engine that Dr. Bickham took to his grave. I charted a path far out into the Proxima Centauri system, not able to leave without making sure we had succeeded. When the jump drive disengaged, I turned the ship back around to face Proxima Centauri, now little more than a fuzzy red dot in the distance. The distortions from the entity and the lensing effect were still apparent, even from afar. I waited, and waited. After three hours had passed, still nothing had changed. We'd failed. It wasn't enough, but then it happened. Without warning, an enormous burst of light shined like a thousand bright burning suns. I sheltered my eyes as best I could and waited. As the light faded, I could finally see it happen. The collusion of the exotic matter and the star's immense pressure triggered a chain reaction, causing the star to collapse in on itself. A newly formed black hole was now sucking in the entire mass of Proxima Centauri beyond its event horizon. And from the looks of it, the monster as well. The space and time distortion spiked for just a second before warping inwards and towards the singularity. The rest of the red dwarf began to spread around the growing event horizon into a bright accretion disk. This time around, it was astonishing to behold. I looked over to see Weaver finally regaining consciousness and was staring ahead as well. For the first time since this nightmare had begun, I could finally breathe. We did it. We had succeeded despite the terrible odds and every nightmare imaginable. Before now, Proxima had never been visible to the naked eye, but not anymore. Within four years, it'll be one of the brightest objects in the night sky. They say in space, no one can hear you scream. Though I'm sure if you were listening, you could have heard us crying. Weaver and I, we sobbed, screamed, cursed, yelled. It came out all at once. The floodgates opened and we couldn't close them. We just held each other as tight as we could, keeping each other warm as we drifted through space towards Sol. After much convincing, I persuaded Weaver to go back into hypersleep. He needed to rest and heal from his injuries. Though he made me promise to wake him back up once we'd reached the Orc Cloud, which I agreed to. I wiped the last tears from my face and watched the doctor slink back into the hypersleep tank. There's another tank for myself right beside him, but I have no intention of ever using it. The shuttle's held up well since making our first jump. We've got about ten more to go before we reach the Orc Cloud, which should only take about another three days or so. The journey back to Titan will take about ten years, and I suspect you'll receive this message long before we've arrived. Roberts, Sydney, and Dr. Bickham gave it everything to protect us. To protect you. Torrance. I'm sorry. You were just scared and alone like the rest of us. You just wanted to feel safe again. If there is a God, I hope he has mercy on you and takes you to that good place. 
decade in space is a long time to spend awake. But the secrets of the jump drive remain locked away. There's still so much work left to be done. And I've got nothing but time now. Besides, in a couple of years, Weaver and I will be the same age. I'll wake him eventually, after he's rested. He'll need all the strength he can get. There are much bigger beasts to kill now. Thank you for listening to this story, guys. This has been one that's been in the works for a long time, and I'm happy to share it with you. I'll see you around.